for Creamer Media's policy, I'm Lungile Ngompe. Joining me is author James Brent Stein, here to discuss his book titled The Dirty Secrets of the Rich and Powerful, Exposing the Dark Side of Capitalism. Your book explores the myriad of ways that some high net worth individuals and multinational corporations intensify global inequality. Can you explain why you think some of these corporations are not paying their fair share in taxes and also mention some of the broader societal consequences of this conduct? I think that uh, companies are being very clever. So I, you know, I don't think the big listed companies are breaking the law necessarily. But what I'm saying is that they're so powerful and they're so strong and well resourced that they are able to to color outside the lines legally in ways that smaller companies and sm- and smaller people and smaller entities are unable to do. So you know, the question isn't whether what they are doing is illegal. The, que- the question is whether it's morally acceptable and what governments are doing about it. I think that the evidence is quite clear that uh, you look at big big companies, you look at uh, the results, you look at super wealthy people, the top 1% in the, on the, in the globe, you try and look at the amount of tax they pay, and uh, I think the data is quite public, how little many of them actually pay. What, what, uh, what seems to be happening uh, globally is that many of these people um, go into philanthropy, now, philanthropy is not paying tax. Philanthropy is building your own brand by using money you should be paying for tax. And you get to decide where you want to spend the money. And it's giving you another tax break. So rather than paying tax, you're just getting further value out of, of, out of contributing. It's, philanthropy is not bad. Don't misunderstand me. But uh, what I'm saying is I think it's just another way that people are using to not pay their fair share. And uh, again, you know, not necessarily that people are acting illegally, but the disconnect between governments and uh, these super powerful, super wealthy individuals and entities is just massive. Governments are no longer, in my view, calling the shots. I think big companies are calling the shots globally at the moment. And I think that's fundamentally one of the bottom line uh, points of this book that I'm raising is what does that mean? What does that mean if governments that are democratically elected generally are no longer really really calling the shots, not really in control of our futures. Can you describe some of the methods that some high net worth individuals around the world enact in order to pay as little tax as possible? Just an example, locally, you got out of the top 20 of the biggest companies listed in the JSE, 16 of them are no longer South African headquartered businesses. You look at NASPAS as an example, the biggest entity on the JSE isn't a South African business anymore. Technically, it's now headquartered in the Netherlands. The same for most of the others. Now, why did they do that? I've written a lot about Steinoff and, the, and what happened there. And one of the triggers for this book was, so this is sort of a follow-up on the work I did on Steinoff as well, because that's what triggered my thinking along the lines that I wanted to explore a bit further in this book. And, Ste- and Steinoff always was a South African-based company till 2015 when they headquartered their business in Amsterdam. So it became a Dutch company and they took their main listing to Germany. So their primary listing was in Germany. Their headquarters was in Amsterdam, but it was being run out of Stellenbosch until the crash in 2017. Why do companies do this? You know, why are so many companies starting to headquarter themselves in Mauritius, for example? Because Mauritius has a tax rate of 15%. It's very beneficial. It's very good for the companies. It's not good for for South Africans, of course. And, you know, so many companies are using the Netherlands as a as a conduit. And there's many similar countries. London is another one. Singapore is, is another one. You have these countries that are very pro-business. They, they like to say they're pro-business. They make it very easy for companies to go there. Uh, and they have what they call letterbox companies. In the Netherlands, there's thousands. I think it's something like 21,000 letterbox companies. And those are big companies like Walmart and uh, many South African companies. They don't have a fixed presence in the Netherlands, but they've got an office there and they've got a post box, which is why they're called letterbox companies. And that means they've got a headquarters in the Netherlands where they only pay something like 10% corporate tax. And they channel the profits that they make elsewhere to the Netherlands uh, because that's where the headquarters conveniently is located. And from there, the money goes to places that are tax havens, generally, places like um, Liechtenstein or uh, the Canary Islands, to name two. And that's how it works. You know, another way that these companies also operate is 
And this is what Steinoff did, by the way. The business is here. They make the profits here in South Africa. But the rights to the brand is in another country, in the Netherlands or one of the others. So the right to use the brand in South Africa means you have to pay them conveniently all the profit you've made. So you don't make any profit locally, so you can't be taxed. And so the money goes there. But you've got to ask, in my view, where the money is being generated. And, and I've got to ask, where are the resources to generate the, the income? You know, where is that being consumed? Uh, and that's why I think we've got to relook really these things. Um, you know, you can't just take all the profits out of the country uh, to a place where you're re registered um, and not pay any tax locally. You know, you look at companies like Google, similar sort of things, the big uh, IT tech companies, Facebook. You know, it's, it's fascinating if you dig into it to try and figure out how much tax they're actually paying and what is the impact. Can you elaborate on the role that tax havens play in tax avoidance and tax evasion? And can you also detail the amount in revenues that the respective governments of developing countries lose to tax havens? Tax havens are places where the profits eventually end up. And these are places where there's no transparency. All of these massive uh, high net worth individuals, you know, their assets and their money is, is, is funneled towards that, often through a, a conduit place like the Netherlands. London is a big conduit as well. So the money goes there and then it goes to these tax havens where there's very big lack of uh, transparency, lack of accountability. Um, and it's, it's a, I think, a big problem. You look at a place like Canary Islands. I, I don't have the numbers on me. It's in the book. I do go into some of the numbers there. But, I mean, the, 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 the numbers is enormous. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars per year that's ending up in these places. That's money that's not been taxed. And, um, yeah, it, it deserves more oversight on a global level. But, you know, the problem is that it doesn't help um, one country does something the other countries don't. Because then, you know, people will just go from this country and to the other country and then say, well, we'll just uh, establish our business in Mauritius, for example, and not in South Africa. To, to address something like tax havens, you've got to have global uniformity. You've got to have all, it's like climate change, which still isn't where it should be. It's, it's the same problem. It doesn't help you have a few countries doing something about it and the others don't because these guys are so powerful and so flexible that they'll just move to the places that still allows them to do what they want to do. So you've got to have everybody on the same page, and I don't think that's the case at the moment. To what extent has the rule of law and coordinated action by governments been able to deal with tax avoidance by some multinational corporations and high net worth individuals? Yeah, I don't think there's uh, there's been much success. I, I think that uh, governments are uh, very poor monitors and managers and uh, regulators and facilitators of what the world has become. The world is now a digital uh, playground. Globalization is a real thing. Uh, you can, with a click of one button, send you know a whole bunch of zeros anywhere in the world. And governments are still stuck in the dark ages, particularly governments in places like South America or perhaps in some Eastern European countries, African countries, you know, we're still very much behind the curve. So people are running around us. I, I don't think governments have a handle on this. If you don't appoint sharp people, you don't resource them adequately, you know, you're not going to get a handle on this. We're talking about people that are so powerful and so well-resourced that, you know, they, they, run, they just run rings around governments at the moment. It's a real concern, I think. Can you tell the methods that some pharmaceutical companies use to ensure that they are able to wield power and influence within global healthcare? And what type of effect does this have on the healthcare system of South Africa and other countries? Yeah, so I think this was one of my most passionate issues I, I dug into. The book essentially contains about 18 case studies of issues where I think powerful entities are doing things that we should all really be aware of. And we're not really issues that aren't illegal, but I would argue in many cases are morally and ethically questionable. And, you know, my issue about this book is trying to raise awareness of these issues and say, guys, this is happening around us. What do we think about this? You know, uh, this is affecting me, you, everybody. It's the poor most deeply. And pharmaceutical companies, I think, uh, was one of the issues that I've been interested in for a long time. And, you know, for me, it started probably 20 years ago when I was still a journalist. 
And it was just fascinating how tuberculosis medicine was incredibly expensive. And TB is a big problem in South Africa. Uh, and at the time, there was a pill that people that were extreme sufferers of TB, it, they needed one pill a week to, to stay alive. And that pill at the time was about a thousand rand a pill. Now, the people suffering from that level of TB are very poor people generally. How are they going to afford a thousand rand a pill? It's, it's, I mean, it's impossible. But the same pill was seven rand in India. The same pill. And for me, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. And yet, when you look into it, and I go into some examples in the book as well, this is stock standard for most medicines out there. Countries like South Africa, we are overpaying for medicine. The same medicine is a fraction of the price in places like India. This includes, for example, very expensive cancer medicine. A big part of the reason is due to South African patent law, which is open to being exploited. Basically, what happens is you get a patent for about 25 or 30 years, which makes sense because you invest billions to develop a new product. So you've got to recover your cost. I, I understand that. But what tends to happen is many companies simply three or four years before the patent runs out, they go and make a small tweak, they add a bit of sugar or they take out a bit of salt or something silly. There's many examples. And they just renew the patent for another 30 years. And while in that whole period, nobody else can bring a product in that does, you know, that does the same thing with the same ingredients. So they sit with a complete monopoly over that sort of medicine. Whereas elsewhere in India, for example, in Brazil as well, it's very interesting. And all our BRICS partners, the way they deal with patents is completely different to South Africa. We follow the American, European sort of style, and it's just unfathomable to me why that's the case. It's, it's coming at a massive cost to, to people that can afford it the least. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big concern to me. In what ways do technology and social media companies impact on global political stability, privacy, and mental health? Well, we, by the time this goes out, we'll know what the outcome of the American election was. And I think there's your best example of uh, the influence of uh, social media platforms on global politics and stability. I think the world has never been in the space where we are now, where people are being influenced from a very young age on something that we all carry in our hands from the moment we wake up till the moment we go to sleep, whether you want to admit it or not, we are all trying to see what's next, what's happening in our feeds. You know, oh, it's just our friends or our family, it's safe. But there's algorithms and these algorithms work in certain ways. There are things that we should be discussing, debating. There's been a bit of debate in American politics about TikTok in particular, but also Facebook. You remember Mark Zuckerberg stood up and apologized to all those children and their parents at, in Congress. You know, he didn't know that uh, these children were being influenced uh, or whatever the case might be. But, you know, you look at just simple things, how easy it is for young children to be active on TikTok, on Facebook, on whatever platform, you know. And these companies, they can't say they're not aware. You know, they make it in my view, as easy as possible for these youngsters to be open to these influences. And I think they must be held accountable and more responsible for, for what's, what's, what's happening. In your book, you suggest that when they transgress the law, the fines that some social media companies receive is meager when measured against the revenues they are able to generate. What can global policymakers do to ensure that these type of companies are fairly regulated without compromising on the innovative potential of the sector? It's, again, it's a difficult thing. There's a chapter about artificial intelligence that I also just went into a little bit. And I do think AI is going to be another big leap forward in the world, the impact of AI and uh, the ability of it to influence all sorts of things. This is already happening. You know, the way things are going to be manipulated and changed, it's, it's a massive question, a massive concern. And how do you regulate? How do you change things? The only way is to better capacitate uh, governments. Governments must put more resources into this space, into the tech space, into the online space. There should be regula regulators that are adequately resourced that are adequately staffed with people that are well remunerated. Otherwise, the best people are always going to go to the private sector. 
and get some get the best people in the private sector and pay them what they want to come and work inside government to work on drawing up regulations which these companies have to stick to and then work together with other governments for example going back to the pharmaceutical example if south africa can use its position in brics to learn from india learn from china learn from brazil about the way that medicine works in those countries where it's much better for the poor because medicine is so much cheaper but here we are not doing that so learn from one another and uh, resource your regulators uh, much better and give them the authority to to act swifter that was james brainstein discussing his book the dirty secrets of the rich and powerful exposing the dark side of capitalism